On the 27th of January 1967, the three crew members for the first demand Apollo flight arrived at Launch Complex 34 for another test in preparation for their launch. For Gus Grissom, the commander of the mission, Apollo 1 was turning out to be a poisoned chalice. He was deeply unhappy about the spacecraft, telling one friend, I hate that capsule, it's all wrong. He wasn't the only astronaut who held strong opinions on the condition of the Block 1 spacecraft. The previous day, the backup crew, commanded by Wally Shearer, had run through a test inside the spacecraft with an environment of ambient air. Shearer claims to have told Grissom, I don't like it, you're going to be in there with full oxygen tomorrow, and if you have the same feeling I do, I suggest you get out. For the crew, the test was just one more hurdle that had to be successfully completed before they could launch on the planned date of the 21st of February. To Lola Morrow, who worked as a secretary to the astronauts, it was apparent that there was some apprehension amongst them because she stated, the test was something they didn't want to do. Despite all of the concerns about the spacecraft, it was business as usual as Grissom entered the spacecraft cockpit at 1pm Eastern Standard Time and took his place in the left-hand couch. He was followed by Roger Chaffee, the pilot for the mission, who slid over to the, the right-hand couch, and then Edward White, the senior pilot, who occupied the centre couch. Once all of the crew were inside the spacecraft, the hatch was finally closed at 2.42pm. Just a few minutes later, at 2.45pm, the process to purge the ambient air inside the cockpit and replace it with pure oxygen to a pressure of 16.7 psi began. The hatch, the high internal pressure and the use of 100% oxygen all added up to a deadly combination. The findings of the investigation detailed three stages to the fire. By using the times quoted in the report, these stages can be incorporated into a timeline of events. At 6.20pm, the ground teams were ready to carry out the part of the countdown test that simulated the transfer of power by unplugging the umbilicals. It was at this point that a hold was ordered to try to improve the issues being had with the communications. The final voice transmission from the spacecraft before the report of fire came at 6.30.14. At 6.30.45, White's biomedical readings indicated that there was no alarm in his responses, indicating that either there was no fire at this point, or if there was a fire, it had not yet been detected. The first sign that anything was wrong came at 6.30.54.8, when a significant voltage transient was recorded. A search online describes voltage transients as fast-moving high energy bursts, lasting for just a few milliseconds, that are superimposed onto the normal mains power supply. This probably indicates the start of the chain of events that led to the crew's deaths. At this point, it is theorised that damaged wiring caused arcing to occur in the lower equipment bay on the commander's side. It continues that nearby Rachel netting absorbed the heat from the arcing and it formed a heat spot that grew before bursting into flames. This indicates the start of the first stage of the fire. If we allow a couple of seconds for this process from heat being generated by arcing to the fire beginning, then we can use 6.31pm as the ignition point. Sometime in the next few seconds, the crew first see the fire, and one of them, probably White, tries to get the attention of the outside teams of the communications with the first of three transmissions from the spacecraft. This is followed up by another communication again probably by White, reporting that there is a fire. During this report, it appears that White had already begun his emergency procedures, because it is recorded that his suit circuit flow is temporarily interrupted. This may be when he disconnects his oxygen inlet hose. The first transmission from the spacecraft ends with White once again trying to get the attention of the outside teams. This transmission is cut off and this may have been due to the fire breaking out of its point of origin and rapidly spreading up the left hand side of the cockpit, causing White to concentrate his attention on starting the hatch opening process. From now on, all communications from the spacecraft would be from Chaffee. Grissom had also started his own emergency procedures by attempting to activate the cockpit pressure release valve but with fire surrounding the valve, it meant he had to put his hand into the flames, and as a result, he was unable to do so. At this point, it is recorded in the report 
that the fire started to become intense. The pure oxygen had permeated everything inside the cockpit over a number of hours and with so much fuel available the fire quickly spread. One of the sources of fuel was the Velcro or as Stephen Clemens, one of the spacecraft ground crew working outside the spacecraft that day, pointed out not the Velcro itself but the material used to attach it to the walls, a highly flammable adhesive. Clemens added the adhesive also gave off a highly inflammable gas that adhered to the surface material. The netting that was hung up in the spacecraft was by now dripping burning material downwards onto the floor. North American had wanted to install protective covers across the floor, but NASA turned down this idea, stating that in space they wouldn't be needed and on the ground they could use mats. Now, all of the exposed flammable objects installed on the floor burned out of control. Adding to this were the mats that exploded into flames sending a wave of fire under the couches. The rest of the emergency egress procedures required White's headrest to be lowered and the ratchet tool to be placed in the lock and turned to release the six latches that held the hatch in place. Following this, White needed to pull the hatch out of its seal in the spacecraft hull and place it behind his head. With the fire quickly intensifying, it was observed through the hatch window that two pairs of hands were now working on the handle as Grissom had now joined in the attempt to get the hatch open. Sensors inside the cockpit recorded that the internal pressure had exceeded 21 psi. This is an indication of the intensity of the fire and something reflected in the next report from the spacecraft. This report came from Chaffee, who was on the right hand side of the spacecraft, maintaining a communications link to the control center. As the fire took hold, he switched the power source from the external source to the simulated internal power source and increased the lighting in the cockpit. Of the three men, Chaffee was perhaps in the worst situation. While his two crewmates were occupied with trying to open the hatch, Chaffee could do nothing but sit and watch the fire spread towards him. For all the talk about the Apollo cockpit being voluminous, it was still a very small space for three men wearing spacesuits in a 1G environment and there was nowhere to hide in the flames now overwhelming the cockpit. The crew was now operating in an environment where even aluminium bursts into flames, a fact attested to by Stephen Clements who stated that the heat was so intense that it melted aluminium alloy struts in the mainframe. Under this heat, the astronaut spacesuits quickly deteriorated. Grissom's lower half and back were taking the full brunt of the searing heat as it raged on the left hand side of the cockpit and the thermal protection offered by his pressure suit failed. To try and seek some shelter from this, Grissom pushed the top half of his body against the bulkhead below the hatch sill as he continued to help White who remained on his couch despite being enveloped in a blazing shroud of fire. At this point the heat had caused the internal pressure to rise dramatically, causing the cockpit hull to fail and it ruptured under at least 29 psi, sending flames shooting out of the breach like a blowtorch. This rupturing indicated the end of stage 1. The report noted that stage 2 saw the escaping of the oxygen atmosphere through the split in the hull, resulting in the internal pressure dropping, but it also caused the fire to increase to its most intense level as convection currents caused a firestorm in the cockpit. By now the spacesuits of all three crew members had been damaged, as shown by part of Grissom's spacesuit being found outside of the spacecraft following the rupturing of the hull. White had by now also tried to find shelter from the heat, but only after the fire had burned through his harness. Post-flight analysis showed that his harness buckle was still locked. Having to place their hands into the fire to work the handle, it probably became impossible to turn it further than they had done once their gloves had burnt through. The gloves they were wearing had been inherited from the Gemini program, but in this emergency they proved to be woefully inadequate. The tasks that the Gemini astronauts were called upon to perform while suited up had required gloves with a high level of dexterity, but this had meant that they were tightly fitted to the hand. During the fire these types of gloves would have eventually deteriorated exposing the crew's hands to the fire and of course the ratchet tool itself would have been soaking up the heat itself. It must also have been terrifying to see their clear space helmet visors begin to deform and blacken just inches from their faces. Despite all of this it is recorded that both Grissom and White were found with their arms reaching up towards the hatch. It had been a valiant attempt 
and scorch marks on the spacecraft's ablative hatch indicated that they may have indeed broken the seal of the inner hatch. This marks the final transmission from the spacecraft, which was a cry of pain from Chaffee. All voice transmissions were terminated at this point, and there was a loss of telemetry data. The report notes that the pressure within the cockpit now dropped to atmospheric pressure. This stage has seen the greatest conflagration with an estimated maximum temperature of at least 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit, but the fire has up to now remained relatively smokeless. Following the outrush of the cockpit environment, the fire is, for the most part, extinguished. A fire does continue in the left-hand side of the equipment bay, but it was localised to the area of the environmental control unit. With the fire all but out, heavy smoke now formed and large amounts of soot was deposited on most of the spacecraft interior. The report states that this stage saw the rapid production of high concentrations of carbon monoxide. The crew began breathing in this heated concoction of toxic fumes and Grissom and Chaffee succumbed to the terrible conditions. There is evidence to suggest that White was able to work on for a couple more seconds before he too became unconscious. In the book, Apollo Pilot, based on the memoirs of Don Isley, he states that White expired from searing hot gases that suffocated him and burned out his lungs. The crew had suffered from high concentrations of carbon monoxide, leading to cerebral hypoxia and cardiac arrests. The investigation revealed that the internal pipes carrying oxygen throughout the spacesuits of White and Chaffee were relatively soot free. This meant that the fumes that led to their deaths had not been transported to their space helmets by the environmental control system. Instead the fumes had entered their spacesuits through areas that had been damaged by the fire. Grissom's spacesuit was too extensively damaged to tell definitively if this was the case in his death. By this point the cockpit atmosphere was now lethal. It is approximately at this time that the outside teams managed to open up all three of the spacecraft hatches. It is to no avail because by this time the crew could not be saved. As the inner hatch finally opened, the toxic fumes generated during the fire rushed out into the faces of the rescuers. Looking into the blackened interior, nothing could be seen of the crew. When the smoke finally cleared up enough to see inside, the transmission over the communications loop from Donald Babbitt, the pad leader, said it all. I'd better not describe what I see.